All right, let's get started. Uh, if you remember, we were covering execution models or alternative approaches to exploiting concurrency uh, in modern machines. And we stopped in the middle of vector processors, SIMD processors. And we're going to hopefully finish them this week. And then next week we can move on to memory, if not tomorrow. So now you know a lot of execution models, which is good. Once the slide is green, you know everything that's out there to be known. Of course, that's not true. You know that. There's a lot more, but uh, you can leave that for a future architecture course. So this is a reading that I assigned a little bit late. I'm a little bit hesitant about assigning this reading, but since we don't have a reading on GPUs, I think it's good for you to have it. It's written uh, not so... It's, it's a good paper, but it's written not so greatly from a beginner's perspective. So if you have trouble understanding this reading, reading I understand. Uh, if you follow the lectures, I think lectures will be hopefully uh, more clear. But once you go through the lectures, if you do the reading, I think the reading will more, make more sense after you listen to the lectures, in this case, rather than before. Okay, and you know that you, can, you should come to the lecture, hopefully, and ask questions. Although I hear that there are no questions allowed in that. But there's an upper afterwards where you can ask questions if you want. <laughs> okay, uh, so this is where we are. I'm going to uh, just jog your memory very quickly. We were talking about single instruction, multiple data processing, which is exploiting regular or data parallelism. Uh, and the idea is very simple. Single instruction operates on multiple data elements. You decode one instruction, but you can operate on a million elements. In time or in space, you need multiple processing elements, which is always good, right? Uh, by the way, I, uh, I needed coffee this morning, right before the lecture. And I go to Tannenbar and there's a line. Uh, what do I do? I don't wait in the line, otherwise I wouldn't be here lecturing. So I go to the other functional unit, which is the coffee shop right here in this building. And that functional unit is not contended by other instructions, meaning people. So I'm able to get my <laughs> coffee instruction serviced much faster. <laughs> so it's a very fundamental principle, right? If you have multiple functional units, you can do multiple things. Or you can do one thing faster, because now you have a choice. So redundancy, this is, you can think of this as redundancy, right? Multiple processing elements. We're going to use that for doing the same operation on different data elements in a redundant manner, except it's a different operation because it's really happening on different data elements. So redundancy has a lot of benefits. Fault tolerance we've covered in one of the latest lectures. Here, it's really parallelism. Redundancy enables parallelism. And the last thing that I've experienced recently was redundancy helps me improve my performance because even though I need to do one thing, this functional unit happens to be in a better shape to service me at that moment in time versus this other functional unit. So this is very much similar to scheduling a task on multiple cores, right? If this core is not contended, why don't you schedule the task on this core? Don't design an operating system that schedules the task on the most heavily contended core. Okay. Okay, we've covered time-space duality. Uh, you know that an array processor uh, executes a SIMD instruction that operates on multiple data elements at the same time using different spaces, meaning different functional units at the same time which means that all of your functional units need to be capable of pretty much everything. Whereas a vector processor is more frugal. Uh, you can, an instruction operates on multiple data elements in consecutive time steps using the same space. So, and this is a pictorial view. I'm not going to go through this again. You can listen to the lecture again. But vector processors are uh, much more frugal, as you can see. Here you have general purpose processing elements that can do load, add, multiply, and store. Here, you can specialize your processing elements to do different things. But of course, it's slower, as you can see. And one of you asked the question in the last lecture, why is this better than a pipeline machine? Hopefully, I'll answer that question with an example today. Uh, OK, I'm going to skip this. You know that this is VLIW. And a SIMD processor uh, basically encodes multiple operations performed by the single operation, basically, and adds on multiple data elements. So it's, uh, its encoding of instructions is much better. Of course, it's not as capable as you can see. Here, you can do multiple independent operations concurrently. OK, again, review uh, very quickly, just to remind you, we're going to operate on vectors rather than scalar or single data values. We're going to operate on multiple data values, 
So we need vector registers, we need vector length, we need vector stride. If you don't remember the stride, you will see it again today, but stride is the distance between two elements of a vector. You need to know this in order to be able to fetch many elements into the vector register. Okay, so uh, this was one of the latest slides we were at. You can func uh, pipeline the vector functional units, and each pipeline stage can operate on a different data element. You'll see this pictorially today. Vector instructions allow deeper pipelines because there are no dependencies within a vector. Right? If you're adding two elements uh, from arrays A and B, this AI, uh, A0 plus B0 is independent of A0, A1 plus B1, is independent of A2 plus B2, is independent of A3 plus B3, dot, dot, dot. So there's a huge amount of independence. There's no control flow within a vector because you're doing the same operation on many elements. You don't need branches. We will see that we're going to eliminate a lot of branches from the code. And you have a known stride. This allows easy address calculation. Basically, you take the base address uh, and then you multiply it by the stride. Uh, you, you add to it stride times the index of the element, right? Because the elements are spaced apart in terms of uh, the stride. And we're not, we're not going to cover this concept, but this enables easier movement of data because you know the addresses and you can generate the addresses very early, actually. That way, your memory system can, if you will, figure out the addresses and bring them to you much earlier. But this is an advanced concept we'll talk about. It's called prefetching, basically, but we're not going to talk about this in this course unless you decide to stay over the summer, which I don't think anyone here wants to. <laughs> and you shouldn't, because you should take time to uh, distill the concepts and enjoy the summer. Okay, vector processor advantages. This is where we were, basically. There are no dependencies within a vector. As a result, you can pipeline, you can parallelize really well. You can have very deep pipelines without any dependencies, and we will see that. Each instruction generates a lot of work. Basically, with a single encoding, you say add, a million things happen. In that sense, it's very efficient. In fact, that's one of the reasons why GPUs are very efficient, because with a single instruction, you can specify many, many pieces of work. This is not true in the von Neumann earlier single instruction, sing single data architecture that we saw, right? An, in an instruction generates only one piece of operation. Add two numbers together instead of adding one million pairs of numbers together. This reduces the instruction fetch bandwidth requirements. So in a GPU, for example, instruction fetch is not a problem. It's really the data fetch that's a problem. Highly regular memory access pattern, we just talked about this, and no need to explicitly code loops. There are fewer branches in the instruction sequence. Now, this is not necessarily true, as we will see, because your machine usually can have a small vector register length, but your arrays might be much, much larger. Right? So you'll need to explicitly code loops still, but you'll eliminate a lot of branches. So, of course, with every other idea, as you know now, uh, there's always a downside. And the downside of vector processors is it works only if parallelism is regular. If you have this sort of parallelism, this machine is really good at doing it. So vector operations get a big plus-plus over here. The problem is it's very inefficient if parallelism is irregular. So that's why you cannot use your GPUs to do, for example, very complicated single-threaded transactions because you'd be wasting 500 watts of power on this transaction that you could execute much better on an out-of-order Intel processor. For example, searching for a key in a linked list. If, you, if, you, if that's what you're doing, that's, if that's the only thing you're doing and there's not much parallelism, then you don't get the performance. And in fact, I, I like this uh, paper by Fisher, Josh Fisher, when he invented the very long instruction word architectures, which you saw, VLIW. Uh, and the enormously long instruction word with 512 bits. He basically wrote, to program a vector machine, the compiler or hand coder must make the data structures in the code fit nearly exactly the regular structure built into the hardware, basically the vector length. That's hard to do in the first place and just as hard to change. One tweak and the low-level code has to be re rewritten by a very smart and dedicated programmer who knows the hardware and often the subtleties of the application area. Hopefully, this will become a little bit more clear. How many of you program GPUs here? Okay, one, two, a few, basically. That's good. I mean, I didn't expect you to. I, didn't, I definitely didn't even program before coming to college, I would say. I guess I did in high school a little bit, but that was a long time ago. But GPU, if you do GPU programming, probably you will see that your performance is very sensitive to how you actually optimize your code, how you fit it into the vector registers, how you lay out your data in, inside memory, and we will see that. Okay, the second limitation, 
So I said only. Only is not true because you can actually make everything work. This is still a machine where you can execute any program, but you, you will not be able to efficiently. That's why only is in parentheses. It still works, but you don't get the per best performance or efficiency out of it. Also, there's uh, the, another limitation is memory bandwidth can easily become a bottleneck, especially you don't have a uh, good balance in terms of compute memory operation balance. So you bring an array only once and not do many things on it. You need to bring a lot of elements. Right? You can imagine one operation, one instruction specifies, let's say, a million operations on a million different data elements, which means that your memory needs to supply those elements. Right? And we will see that. We will talk about in this lecture how the memory is designed to supply those elements. One way we've seen before is multi-porting the memory. Right? You actually have a million ports to memory. Doesn't sound very efficient, right? No, but that's one way of doing it. So we're going to see another way of uh, doing it today. And if your data is not mapped appropriately, uh, you may get conflicts. OK, so let's go into a little bit more depth. This is what I uh, uh, drew uh, on, the, uh, on the piece of paper last time as a vector register, basically. basically. Each vector data register now holds n values instead of a single value. And m bit is basically how, how wide is your register, right? Uh, this is a vector register. You basically have vector register 0, and it has n elements in it. So 64 could be a good n, for example. Uh, another vector register, another vector register, and you may have some number of vector registers. And we're going to add some control registers telling us how large, how long are our vectors, vector length. What is the stride? What is the distance between the different elements in memory, not inside the registers? And what is the mask? We'll talk about mask. So masking is how you do conditional operations. Instead of doing branches, you do masking. Basically, the mask register is a, is a register that has n elements in it, n one-bit elements. And that bit specifies whether the vector operation should operate on the corresponding vector register elements. That way, you can actually do, let's say, 64 additions. If all your masks are 1, that means that you're going to add 64 things. But if one, mass, uh, one of the mask bits of register, uh, this uh, entry 0 is 1, everything else is 0, you're still going to do the vector operation, but you're going to only have the first two elements added together. And everybody else will not be added because the mask is 0, meaning that you really shouldn't do the operation. That's how you can do conditional operations. And we'll talk about that. It's a pretty cool concept, and it's employed in GPUs today, for example. And it's also employed in other processors, too, but we won't get into it. So maximum vector length can be n. This is the maximum number of elements stored in a vector register. That's good. Oh, OK, we've already talked about this. Indica vector mask register indicates which elements of vector to be operate on. So this is one way of setting the vector mask. This is basically a single bit vector. If, if a vector register's uh, entry is equal to 0, mask is set to 1. Otherwise, it's set to 0. Now, this way, you can do conditional operations based on whether or not the data element is 0 or not. If it's 0, then you will do the next operation conditionally. We'll, get, we'll see an example. But let's look at the functional unit. So we know the registers now. And you can actually, uh, this, is, this is the minimum set of things that you need in a vector uh, machine. Vector functional units. So we've seen functional units before. They, they would operate on a single scalar register value. But now we have vectors. What we can do is we can pipeline uh, the elements into the functional unit. So in this case, this is a six-stage multiplication pipeline, as you can see. It takes vector register 1 as input, vector register 2 as input, and produces the result into vector register 3. So all of the elements are independent of each other. So in the first cycle, it takes element 0 from vector 1 and vector 2. In the next cycle, that moves to this stage, and element 1 gets fetched or uh, dispatched into the functional unit. In the next cycle, element 0 moves to the next stage, element 1 moves to the next stage, and element 2 gets fetched, dot, dot, dot. So you really have six elements, or six pairs of elements, from vector 1 and vector 2 that are being multiplied, as long as you pipeline your multiplier. And at the end of the sixth cycle, you get the results of the first element stored into the destination vector's zeroth element. And the next cycle, you get the result of the second element, or one-th first element, like instead of zeroth element, first element, second element, third element, dot, dot, dot. So in consecutive cycles, you get consecutive elements. So if, in fact, if you want to keep this pipeline full, you can have a huge, like 64 
stage multipli multiplier, right? Because you know that they're all independent of each other. And that's how people built, for example, the earliest supercomputers. The Cray supercomputer had deep pipelines in its multiplier, which is the example over here. How many of you know that there is a Cray machine at ETA? Okay, and you visited it? So that maybe that's a good task for the next uh, lecture. <laughs> you figure out where this Cray 1 machine, which is kind of this, of course, it looks different. I should have taken a picture of it and put it over here. There's a Cray 1 machine in actually the cab building, right? And you can, actually, it wasn't the cab building until recently. You can go and visit and look at it. <laughs> it's not like this, it's huge. <laughs> but basically, Cray 1 was built the, the, exactly the way I described it, and we're going to execute some code on Cray 1 in a little bit. Uh, if you look at this, you don't need to see all of this, but there are some vector registers, as you can see. Uh, there are eight vector registers, and each of them have 64 elements. Each element is 64 bit wide, and this is 1970s. Uh, we'll see what memory banks are soon. Uh, but there's, there's also a scalar portion of machine. It's actually a heterogeneous machine. It's not just purely vector. So this vector part was only this part. But there is also a scalar part, which is heavily pipelined. It was an in-order pipeline at the time. Basically, uh, you see scalar registers and scalar functional units also. So if you were doing vector operations, SIMD operations, the instructions would go over here. If you were doing scalar operations, the instructions would go here. So it's really a heterogeneous machine. Uh, and you don't need to know about the uh, things over here. So let's look at the memory system, because we need to fetch these vectors from memory into the registers, right? And we're going to fetch a lot of things. And I have this thing that's called memory banks over here, which you probably haven't heard of. Uh, and I have 16. So this 16 memory banks allow the fetch of 16 different things in parallel, but it gives you one by one since it's a vector machine. As, and we will see that. So one option, if you want to fetch 16 elements at a time, you can have 16 different copies of memory. That's one solution, right? That sounds very bad because you don't want to copy your memory 16 times. Expensive. Uh, or you can have 16 ports into a single memory. 16 different addresses can be supplied, and you can get 16 different values. That's called a port. It's expensive. If you study the lower level design, you will see that that's an expensive way of building circuits. You can think about it. Or you can have what's called memory banks, as we will see. So why do we need memory banks? Basically, we need to load and store vectors from memory or to memory. Right? This requires loading and storing multiple elements. And elements are separated from each other by a constant distance called stride, as we've seen. We're going to assume stride is equal to 1 for now, but uh, that's fine. Elements can be loaded in consecutive cycles if we can start the load of one element per cycle. Basically, we want the memory system in a vector machine to be, uh, we want to be able to start one, uh, one element every cycle. And every cycle, we want to be able to get one element from the memory system. Right? That's what we want. And if you're doing a load of 64 elements, out, uh, at the end of 64 cycles, we would have gotten uh, the first element. Uh, basically, uh, we, would, we would get one element per cycle, and it would take us 64 cycles to get all of the elements, right? assuming the latency is one. But the latency may be long. Basically, we can sustain a throughput of one element per cycle. So the question is, how do we achieve this with a memory that takes more than one cycle to access? If it, if it takes one cycle to access an element, everything is good, right? It takes one cycle, so you get the first element, it takes the, and then you supply the next address, you get the next element, you supply the next address, you get the next element, dot, dot, dot. That sounds good. The problem is memory is usually more than one cycle to access. Uh, so what we do is we bank the memory. I mean, I've given you other solutions, but we're going to look at banking and then interleave the elements across banks. So let me give you an example. So this is what a bank memory looks like. Uh, you have these different banks, in this case, 16 banks. Each of them has a memory address register and a memory data register, but they have a shared data bus. And then there's a shared address bus. So every cycle to a given bank, you can send the address. It gets slashed here, and the bank can start accessing. So after n number of cycles, it's, it'll give the data into the memory data register, and you can get it back. Which means that in the next cycle, so you, let's say we send the first element here, uh, address, base address. Uh, we give the address over here. And the next cycle, we give base plus stride here. In the next cycle, we give the base plus 
two times stride to get the next element. In the next cycle, we give the base supplies three times stride, dot, dot, dot. That way, we can start the fetch of one element every cycle. Because we know the stride. In this case, stride is one. We know the base address. And we start the access of the first element in the first bank. While that's happening, we can start the access of the second element in the second bank. Dot, dot, dot. Now, your bank can take 10 cycles. And you'll be OK, right? Because you'll start the uh, access of 10 elements in those 10 cycles. And in the next cycle, you will get the result from this element. And then in the next cycle, you get the result from this bank. In the next cycle, you get the result from this bank, dot, dot, dot. So this is a very cheap way of enabling multiple memory accesses concurrently. Because concurrently, you're accessing multiple banks. But every cycle, you're getting only one value. Basically, you have only one data bus over here. Does that make sense? Basically, we divide this memory into these what is called the banks. You can access the banks independently, but you, they share the address and data buses. They share the address and data buses because these are expensive. So if you look at memory, uh, basically, you're going off the CPU chip over here. If you had 16 different buses, you need 16 times 64 bits. That's a lot of bits. That's like 1,024, right? 2 to the 4 times 2 to the 6. 1,024 bits. That means you need 1,024 pins on your CPU. Now, today's CPUs have a lot of pins, but they don't use it for data, most of them. So 1,024-bit pins is really expensive. Here, you can only have 64-bit data bus without requiring all of those 1,024 pins, but you can still sustain a throughput of one element per cycle. Right? That's the idea. That's why they share the address and data buses. That's why this is a che much cheaper design than having many, many data buses to different banks over here. And uh, as I said, you can start and complete one bank access per cycle, which means that you can sustain n parallel accesses, assuming if all n go to different banks. What if they go to the same bank? Well, that's my coffee shop. This is the coffee shop Tannen Bar. <laughs> I want to access it. And I supply my address, but the bank says, Oh, I already have an address here. So I'm servicing somebody else. So if all of the accesses go to Tannenbar, you'll have bank conflicts. Whereas this other coffee shop, whose name I don't know over here, we'll call it the main building coffee shop, <laughs> that happens to be empty, and my access happens to go there, then I can access it fast. So this works only if your accesses are nicely distributed across different banks, right? The first access goes here, the next access goes here, the next address happens to be here, the next address happens to be here. Now, in a vector machine, it's beautiful. If your stride is one, you know that you can lay out your data such that the first elements are always here, the second element is here, third element is here, fourth element is here, dot, 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 and then 16th uh, element is here, and then 17th, or index 16 is over here, right? Basically, every 16th element is placed into this bank. And every 16, uh, starting from 1, every 16th element is placed into this bank. Starting from 2, every 16th element is placed into this bank. Sounds beautiful, right? Is that clear? That way, you eliminate the conflicts. Now, the problem is you don't eliminate all conflicts, right? What if, you're always act what if your stride is 16 now? Now you're screwed. <laughs> Because you always go to the bank zero. <laughs> so that's exactly what Josh Fisher meant when he said this, basically. Basically, one tweak and the low-level code has to be rewritten. One tweak that changes your stride, either in the hardware or the software, then you need to rewrite your code such that you don't get those bank conflicts. This is a huge problem in GPUs, for example. GPUs, you want to eliminate these bank conflicts. You want to lay out your data such that the different uh, operations access data in different banks at the same time. You can start one access per cycle. If you're conflicted on this bank, on Tannenbar, your performance tanks. Make sense? OK, now we're, we've started the memory. So this is actually uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to cover GPUs, because it leads to a very good transition into memory. This is really where you need a high-performance memory system whenever you're really uh, pushing the boundaries of how many, how, much, how many elements you want from this memory system. A single-access memory system is not 
doesn't need to be as high performance, although there, there are other reasons why it needs to be high performance because of latency reasons, right? But here, again, we're doing latency. We'll see that. Okay. So, okay, this is another look at the memory system. As I said, uh, you have the base address, and you add the stride to it. And every cycle, you go through this loop until you finish the number of vector, uh, the, the vector length. So next address is equal to previous address plus stride. If stri so I'll give you this uh, example. If stride is equal to 1, and the number of consecutive elements interleaved across banks, uh, oh, sorry, uh, and number of banks is greater than bank latency, then you can sustain one element per cycle throughput. So, for example, if your bank latency is uh, five cycles, and if your elements are zeroth element is here, first element is here, second element is here, third element is here, fourth element is here, you start the access in the first cycle here, you get the data after five cycles, you can sustain one element per cycle throughput because all of your elements need to be accessed from consecutive locations. That's good. Right? Then you don't get any conflicts. But if your memory latency is, let's say, 17 cycles, here you have 16 banks, by the time you get the data for the first element, you do initiate the access for the 16th element, and you get a bank conflict over here. So, if you want, if it, so how many banks you want to add to your memory system depends on how long your memory access latency is in the bank. If your memory access, in this case, in Cray, for example, Cray 1, memory access latency was 11 cycles. That's why they had 16 banks. They could have had 11 banks, but now addressing 11 banks is hard because we're using binary numbers, right? So they had 16 banks, and at the end of the 11th cycle, they would get the result out of this bank for the first element. At the end of the 12th cycle, they would get the result out of this bank from the sec for the second element because they would have started the access in the uh, next cycle. At the end of the 12th cycle, you would get this. Uh, the 13th cycle, you would get this. 14th, 15th, dot, dot, dot. And you have enough banks if your stride is one. Right? Now, if your stride is something else, then the problem becomes more complex. That's why it's good to have strides of one. Right? Okay, so these are, this, uh, for example, if I tell you uh, if your stride, uh, no, if, if you have a memory access latency of, let's say, 33 cycles, how many banks do you need such that you can sustain one element per cycle if your stride is one? How many would you tell me? Your access latency is 33 cycles. We want one element per cycle throughput. Every cycle we want to get one element out of it. And our stride is one. How many banks do I want there? Anybody? 64. Yes, you, you say 64. Uh, and you're absolutely right. <laughs> now, if you're a mathematician, the answer would have been 33. <laughs> but you're an engineer. That's why you're here. That's why the answer is 64. Because you know the constraint. The constraint is you have binary numbers to address this. And the, the closest... Uh, you, you need at least 60, uh, basically, you can, uh, if you have 32 banks, you know that you'll get a conflict, right, for one of the accesses, because your memory latency is 33. If you have 64 banks, you won't get a conflict. You would be wasting 31 of those banks, but that's okay. Now you're able to address them, because you can, you can address them in a bi in, uh, with binary numbers. Does that make sense? Okay, good. So this question becomes even more fun if you change the stride, of course, but maybe we'll have an interesting question on that. Okay, so let's look at the example that I was promising. So I'll give you this, uh, not, maybe not so interesting code, but it exists in real programs. Basically, for 50 elements, we do this operation. Basically, we're averaging, this is element-wise averaging of two vectors. We're averaging A and B uh, and writing the results into the C. So let's take a look at the scalar code in some uh, language, some assembly language. Basically, uh, we move uh, the counter, loop counter, 50, into R0. We move the base addresses of the arrays into these two, three registers. And then the first thing we do is, uh, basically, it's a loop. You need to loop through 50 times, and every time you need to do this operation. The first element in the loop loads A, A0 in this case, and then increments the base address. So there's this funny notation that I have over here, which some machines actually use. 
This is called auto increment addressing. Basically, you load from memory address in R1, put it into put the result into R4, and you automatically increment uh, R1 such that you go to the next element. So actually, a lot of machines have that uh, have this addressing scheme where you automatically increment the address one by one uh, by one because of this behavior of programs. You basically go through a vector one by one, which is consecutively laid out in memory. And the second uh, load basically loads from memory address R2, which is uh, starting from the base address of uh, this array B, and then it loads into R5, and then auto increments R2. And the third operation is basically this addition over here on the vector, uh, not vector, the scalar elements that you just loaded. And then the next one is a division, which is a shift by one in this case. And then the next one is basically a store, which is very similar to this load, except you store into the base address, starting with address C, auto, uh, and then store register 7, which is the result of this, and then auto increment. And then to do the loop condition, we have this interesting instruction here, which is decrement and branch if not 0. Basically, what this does is it decrements R0, which is our loop counter, and then checks if it is zero. If it's not zero, it goes back to the loop. If it is zero, then we're done with the addition. So it's a compact way of doing the branching, as you can see. And some machines have that. PowerPC actually has these weird instructions that look like this. It's fun, right? That's how you can design an instruction uh, set. But if you look at this, this is interesting in several ways. Uh, a lot of these operations are dependent on each other. As you can see, within the loop, you have a huge dependency. If you look at this in a scalar code, these things are dependent on each other, right? A lot of them. Not, not all of them, though. Uh, we're going to look at the... Uh, and these are the latencies that I'm going to associate with them. One cycle uh, for these moves. 11 cycle, which is the Cray latency for the load. Uh, 11 cycle for the other load. Add takes four cycles. Shift takes one cycle. Store takes 11 cycles. And this branch takes two cycles. So let's take a look at how long it takes to execute... Uh, first of all, how many dynamic instructions do you have here? 304, yeah, that's good. <laughs> I'm sure you calculated it. But it's not that hard to calculate. You, one, two, three, four, five, six here, six times, 50 times you iterate, that's 300, and then 304 to set up the loop. Okay, well, I've given you the answers, that's okay. <laughs> you can do it by, by yourself. But basically, scalar execution time on an in-order processor with one bank. It turns out, uh, if you have only one bank, and it takes 11 cycles to access memory, you'll take 11 cycles to access this. In the next cycle, you'll start the access. You'll take 11 cycles to do this. Uh, after you get the data, you'll take four cycles here, one cycle here, 11 cycles here, two cycles. So you add up all of these because these are dependent instructions. Everything is dependent, as you can see over here. right? Uh, and also, it depends on your pipeline depth, but I'm going to assume uh, that. Basically, you add up this 33, 37, 39, 40, 40 times 50 is 2,000 and 2,004. That's 2,004 cycles. Now, I'm assumed in a pipeline processor where, how do you predict this branch? I've assumed you predicted not taken. If you predicted taken, you'll, get up, you'll, get with a, you'll come up with a different result than 2,004. Because taken is a good prediction, actually, in this case. But let's, let's predict it not taken for now. Okay, so that's the problem with having one bank, basically. If you have one bank, you cannot start this load... Uh, uh, while you're doing this load, because you have, uh, this, this is actually accessing memory for 11 cycles. Right? Now, if you have two banks, uh, 16 banks, let's say, let's do 16 banks, uh, what we can do is we can, uh, and when we store the consecutive words in consecutive banks, for the first two loads in the loop can be pipelined. Basically, you start the first load in the first cycle. At the end of the 11th cycle, you get the element. You start the second load over here in the second cycle. At the end of the 12th cycle, you get the result. So it takes 12 cycles to finish these two loads. Four more cycles to do the add, 16. One more cycle to do the shift, 17. 11 more cycles to do the store, 28. Two more cycles over here, 30. 30 times 50, assuming not taken branch prediction, is 1,500, and then four cycles over here. So you reduced it 1,500, four cycles by just increasing the memory banks to 16. Actually, you didn't need to increase it to 16. You could have had only two, right? Because in this case, we we're doing two loads in parallel, pipelined. This is scalar code. The first load you can start, the second load you can start in the next cycle. And, okay. So 
you've just learned that banking the memory helps in a pipeline processor also, right? Because this load now can start, the second load now can start its access instead of waiting for 11 cycles, right? So banking is a general concept that helps whenever you need to do multiple accesses to a memory. But we'll see that it's much more powerful in the vector machine. So that's good, 1,500 or four, uh, 1500 four cycles. You may think that that's good. Why 16 banks? We've already discussed this, because 11 cycle memory access latency. But in this case, you really didn't need 16 banks, because you're, you're really doing two loads per cycle. Now, if your branch prediction was something different, if, if you predicted it uh, correctly, then you would be doing more loads. Then that gets interesting, right? You do need more banks in that case. That's why out of order in or, uh, and pipeline machines uh, actually need that as well. Okay, but we're assuming in order uh, processors over here, which means that you're stalling at dependencies, right? Uh, true data dependencies. That's why you cannot pipeline this add with this load. You cannot pipeline this shift with this add. You cannot pipeline dot, 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 because they're all dependent on each other. Okay. So let's look at the vectorizable version of this code. It looks much simpler, if you will. Basically, what is a vectorizable, first of all? A loop is vectorizable if each iteration is independent of any other. It's also called parallelizable. But I like vectorizable. Uh, but basically, in this case, iteration 0 is independent of iteration 1, is independent of iteration 2, dot, dot, dot. Because the induction variable is really the iteration counter, and there is no funny things that you do over here. You don't say C i equals A i plus 1, for example. Now the iterations are dependent on each other, right? Could be. Uh, well, if, if you say C i uh, plus 1 equals A i plus B i divided by 2, now iterations could be dependent on each other. Anyway, we're not going to talk about that. So how do you vectorize it? First of all, if we need to know our vector length, right? Vector length is 50 in this case. Because we know that we're going to element, uh, operate on two vector elements that are of 50 elements each. Vector stride is one. We're going to assume that vectors are laid out uh, that way. This is the first instruction. You load vector A into vector register 0, and this is its latency. It takes 11 cycles to get the first element, and then we want 49 other elements after that, or vector length minus 1 elements after that. So this instruction really takes 11 plus vector length minus 1 cycles. The second instruction loads vector B into the vector register 1, same latency. The next instruction does an add of vector 0 to vector 1 into vector 2. Its latency is the first element addition finishes after four cycles, and then you want 49 other elements finishing and it's pipelined, right? So 4 plus vector length minus 1. The next instruction is a shift. It takes the result of this add, shifts it by 1, puts the result into V3, and it takes this long. And the next, last instruction is a vector store, right? And that basically takes the result of the shift, puts it into, stores it into C, and takes 11 plus vector length minus one cycles. Now, the first thing you notice over here is there's no branch. Branch is gone. That weird decrement B and Z is gone. Because our vector length is smaller than what the machine supports, and we can code this entirely with sequential instructions, SIMD instructions. The second thing you would notice, now I'm going to ask you, how many dynamic instructions are here that you fetch? Wait, wait, 285 is what? A number of cycles? Uh, that's not what I'm asking. You're correct, <laughs> which is good, but <laughs> it's not, that's not what I'm asking. That's the answer to the wrong question, but a correct answer to some other question. How many dynamic instructions we fetch? Just seven, exactly. Basically, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's it. If you go back, we had fetched 304 dynamic instructions and wasted the energy fetching every single one of them. Now we fetch only seven, and we accomplish the same work. That's where the energy efficiency benefit comes from. Now let's see where the performance comes from and how we will get to 285. So, okay, we're going to assume no chaining. We're going to see chaining. Chaining is a fancy word that was developed in vector machines. This is basically data forwarding. You forward one data element from uh, one uh, vector functional unit to another vector functional unit, or the beginning of the same functional unit, if you want to make it complicated. We're going to assume no data forwarding to begin with. Uh, okay. So the entire, in this case, if you don't have data forwarding, the entire vector register needs to be ready 
before any element of it can be used as part of another operation. So you need to finish the entire load to be able to do the add. Now this is very similar to no data forwarding in the scalar pipeline, right? But in the vector pipeline, there is really no reason to do it because once you finish the first element, first pair of elements, load, you can now send it to the add unit and do the add, right? So it's a lot, forwarding is very powerful in a vector machine because all of the data elements are independent in a vector. But we're gonna assume the bad case here. Uh, no chaining, no. So we're gonna assume one memory port, one address generator, and we're gonna assume 16 memory banks. We're gonna interleave consecutive words, consecutive elements in consecutive banks. And this is your result. Basically, this is your, uh, what you do, I think. Is that correct? Okay, yeah. Basically, these two takes two cycles consecutively. Uh, now, one memory port, which means that we can start the load in one cycle, in the first cycle, and then we can start the next element in the same load in the next cycle, next element in the next cycle, next element in the next cycle. The first element will return after 11 cycles, and the next element returns uh, after 49, right? Basically, the load takes 60 cycles, as we predicted over here. Right, 11 plus vector length minus one. That's the first load over here. Then you start the next load. You can start the next load only after this because we have only one memory port. If we had another port to each bank, then we could have actually started this load also here. But we're gonna see that next. Okay, this takes 60 cycles. The add, after, only after the uh, loads, all of the elements of the load finishes, we can start the add. Because remember, we don't have data forwarding. So it takes four cycles and then 49 more for the consecutive elements. And only after all of the elements finish, we can start the shift. And then it takes 50 cycles total, one plus 49. And then only after the shift finishes, we start the store. And that's where your 285 comes from. <laughs> so even with this, we have just 285 cycles. Compare this to 1504. That's a huge improvement, right? And we're, we're not only improving performance, we're also improving efficiency because we're fetching much fewer instructions. We're doing, we're doing the same number of operations, but the amount of control that you do, the instruction fetch that you do is reduced significantly. Okay, so can we do better? It's always a question to ask. Well, I have a lot of assumptions over here. Let's break some of them and make the machine a little bit more complicated. So the idea is vector chaining. You've seen the idea. Forward the data from one vector functional unit to another. Instead of waiting this load to finish all of its elements, when the first element finishes, forward it to whatever is needing it. Right? And it's very simple. It looks like this, basically. Basically, the forwarding path, bypass path, right? Of course, it's, this is pictorial. In hardware, when you design the RTL, you need to uh, do it correctly. Right? That's the idea. And you can do the chaining. So it, it's really a network of chaining network, or forwarding network. In fact, if you remember the machines that we see, they called it the bypass network, right? Because you need to chain between different, this multiplier needs to be able to feed into load, maybe, I'm not sure. But multiplier may need to feed to add, and add may need to feed into the multiplier also. That's, why, that's how things get complicated. Okay, we're gonna assume that, and let's take a look at our code. Well, this is gonna improve our performance. So these are the two things, and then we, still we have one memory port, so this is the first vector load, if you remember. It takes 11 cycles plus 49 to finish all of the elements. And then we start the next load. Now, once we have element zero from the first load and element zero from the second load, which happens at the end of this 11th cycle, we can start the, the add, right? I should have marked these load and add, but you remember the code. No, I have the code over here. Basically, vector load, vector load, vector add. And you have both elements over here. Maybe I, just to jog your memory, I'll just show the Basically, we're doing this, AI plus BI. We've loaded both A0 and B0 at that moment. Now we can start the add because we've chained, we've forwarded the data from the load unit to the add unit. Now add can start, can be pipelined with the load of the remaining 49 elements of the second load. And every cycle we get another Elements, we forward it to the add unit. So every cycle, we start another add operation. Every cycle, we get the uh, element from the second load unit. We take that element. We take the element from here that we've already loaded. We send it to the add unit. 
And now we can overlap the latency of this load with the add. So let's finish this. Basically, uh, this add completes this way. So you do the first, the first add finishes after four cycles from the end of this load. And now we can start the shift. You chain, you forward the data value from that add to the shift. It takes four cycles. Uh, it takes one cycle here. And then you keep forwarding the elements. Now shift latency is overlapped with the add latency because they're both pipelined. Uh, now we can say this load finishes. Now we can start the load of the uh, store. You can say, oh, why don't I start the store over here? Because I have the results over here, right? Remember what we were doing is we want store into C. We've done the add. We've done the divide, uh, which is the shift. And we have the result of the shift, shifter, right here, actually. But we cannot put it into memory because memory is busy doing this load still. It's still loading, I don't know, 50, some number element you can compute, actually. It's loading 50 elements. And until it finishes all of the elements, you cannot store the store because we assumed one port to memory. So the store can start only here. So it starts, and it takes 11 cycles plus 49. So you've overlapped a lot of latency. It's beautiful. Now it's 182 cycles. So 285, 182. Let me finish this example, and then I'll give you a break that's shifted, if that's OK. Unless somebody really needs to have a break. Who, wants, who really needs to have a break? OK, let's have a break then, and then we'll, <laughs> we'll finish this example. Okay, let's continue. So now you know how we got this code from 1504 cycles to 182 cycles, right? So the question again to ask is, can we do better? And the answer turns out to be yes. So where are the cases where this code is not doing well? For example, this load and this load, there's really no dependence that these loads have on each other, right? One is loading from array A, and the other is loading from array B. And we don't have anything dependent, assuming that array A and B, again, even if these are reads, right? There's no, there no dependence. As long as one is not writing to the array, uh, but there's no writing also happening, this is really a load. So these loads are actually independent of each other completely. The reason this load is starting after this load is finishing is there's only one port to memory, one address generator that we assumed. And each bank uh, can be accessed uh, uh, with, with only, only one address generator. So we cannot pipeline these two loads. But if we have more resources, if we duplicated the memory, if we added more ports, we could have pipelined them, right? So we're going to do that. And this load and this store can also not be pipelined, as you can see. While this load is going on, the store cannot start. That's why, even though we had the result over here, we couldn't operate on it until, we couldn't store it until this load finished. Again, the assumption we had was each memory bank has a single port. If we had two ports, meaning if we would start the load of address A, A0 in the first cycle, and then A1 in the next cycle, but also B0 in the next cycle, and then A2 in the next cycle, but also B1 in the next cycle, we could pipeline these two loads, right? For that, you need to be able to have a multi-ported memory. So let's go back to this uh, banking uh, that we had. It's not to be confused. It's a bank, basically. So remember, we had bank 0, bank 1. You can see it, right? Yes and then bank 15. So we had one address generator, which, is, which takes a base address and then adds to it the stride. And then the result goes into the address bus. And the address bus, of course, you select the right appropriate bank. So let's, let's go into a little bit more detail as to how this works. So let's assume that we've laid out such that A0 is here, A1 is here. So somebody needs to do that data layout, which is usually the programmer or the compiler. 
A16 is here, A17 is here, dot, 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 A31 is here. Now, you've laid out your data nicely. 32 is here, dot, dot, dot. Uh, you start with address A. Oh, that's not here. Address A. In the first cycle, you basically supply address A, which means that you go to A0. And there needs to be logic that determines that this maps to bank 0. And how do you do that? Let's say you have a 32-bit address. Uh, let's say this is word addressable to make life easier. Whenever you address it, you get one word out of memory. How do you determine which bank you access? So this is bits 0 through 31. If you have 16 banks, the bottom four bits over here, bits 0 through 3, determine which bank the address is at. Right. So basically, you need four bits to specify the address. OK, so for the base address over here, you'll have 0, 0, 0, 0. So there's control logic that takes you to bank 0, and you start the access from address 0. So you need to have an address port over here, a single port. That enables you to keep accessing it. In the next cycle, you get the stride, you add it to the base, and then start the next access. Basically, the next address you get will be A plus 1 in terms of word. Uh, address, so you really load A1, and the address will be incremented by 1, so your bank will be 1, so the next cycle you start the address from this bank. Now, if this is if you have one address port, if the next cycle you start the dot dot dot, basically. So if you had another load, you basically need another one of these, right? Base, of course it's going to be more expensive, and your base will be B, after you start address 0, you will be able to start uh, B0 access by having another port, which means you another address bus, right? And then another address port over here. Second, this is the first address port, this is the second address port. Let's call them read ports. So in the first cycle, you start the load of this address. Let's look at the execution timeline. You are loading uh, array A. In the first cycle, we start the load of address A0. In the next cycle, A1. While we're starting in the next cycle, A1, we're going to start B0. Right? Uh, doesn't look that, that good, but <laughs> in the next cycle, we're going to start B0. And the, a, the reason we're able to do that is because we, are a, we have another address generator, which is linked to another address port in each bank. And every cycle, you generate one address and send it to the consecutive banks. Does that make sense? That enables you to do two accesses in parallel. You start the first access for address A0 over here. In the next cycle, you start B0. Now, after 11 cycles, you get A0 over here. And after 11 cycles over here, which is one cycle after this, you get B0. Now you can operate on them, right? Make sense? Okay. okay. Any? Now you need more data buses also, right? That kind of sucks. <laughs> but you do. That's why uh, doing this multi-porting is complicated, as you can see. Right? It's not as simple. So your cost increases in the end. Because you need to be able to get A0 here, A1 here, but at the same cycle you're getting A1, you're also getting B0. Right. So you need multiple data buses. Well, in this case, two data buses, that's good. If you want to sustain two ports, you need two data buses. Right. Okay, basically at the end of 11 plus 49 cycles, we get all of the elements of A up to A49. And then one more cycle after that, we get all of the elements B, B49, now we can start the next operation. Basically, we pipelined access to array A and array B this way by adding more hardware, more ports, more address generators, as you can see. So hopefully this clarifies the concept of banking also. Basically, this shows you how important it is to lay out your data. If you're accessing A0, A1, A2, A3 this way, it's important to lay them out to different banks. But if you're accessing A0 first, A16 next, if your stride is 16, they're all mapped to here. So you won't be able to have this nice picture where you get one element per cycle. Okay, 
So let's keep going. Yes. Your vector A, uh, well, in this case, in the, in the picture that we had, has 50 elements, right? We do 50 element iteration. So basically, you would lay it out continuously, right? This is A36 over here, A, uh, I guess in this case, it'll be A52, or is that correct? No, 48. Could you say it again? Where, where exactly what comes from? Oh, so it takes 11 cycles to access one element from one bank. That's the assumption. You start the access at time zero. At the end of the t equals 11. Actually, yeah, basically at the end of uh, t1, you don't get anything. But at the end of t equals 11, you get the first element. So each of these takes 11 cycles to access. And the First element comes after 11 cycles. The second element comes 11 plus 1 cycles from this bank. The next element comes from this bank. One more cycle later. The next element comes one more cycle later from the next bank. So you get 49 more elements. That's where the 49 comes from. Okay? Good. Okay, so let's go back to this picture. We, are, we had this assumption, and based on this assumption, we got this performance because we weren't able to pipeline these loads and pipeline the store with this load. As a result, we got 182 cycles. So if we had this multiple ports that I showed you over here, life would be better. Although, maybe I should switch here. Cycles. But basically, life would look like this. Now we are able to start the load of vector B one cycle after you start the load of vector A because you have two address ports and two data ports. Now these loads are completely pipelined, as you can see. Now, because we have vector uh, forwarding or chaining, you get both data elements at the end of this cycle for A0 and B0. Now you can start the add, as we've seen. Now you can start the shift after four cycles. Now you can start the store. You can start the store here, even if it overlaps with this load, because I'm assuming in one store port also. So not only do I, am I assuming I have two address ports, two, uh, sorry, two ports to load from, it's called a read port. Basically, not only these two read ports, but I'm also assuming I have one write port over here. So while I'm doing two reads, I can also do one write. Now it's more expensive, which means that you need to have another address generator over here, uh, another address bus, but now you're able to do writes into memory. So it's more expensive. But As you can see, we're able to perfectly pipeline this store with that load over here, which we were not able to previously do. And that gets us to 79 cycles only, which is almost a 19x performance improvement compared to 1504 cycles, right? Which is a lot, actually. Now we have more hardware. You could argue about that. What if you add the same hardware to the other code? Actually, you wouldn't get anything. You would need to add some other hardware to be able to get the independent instructions, like out-of-order execution. But this is still reasonably simple hardware with a relatively complicated memory system now, right? You don't do only one access per cycle. But it's still a lot. OK, any questions on this? So now you see the power of the machine, if you will. And if you can do better than this, it'd be good to know. <laughs> but it's hard to do better than this unless you go to some other, because this is de dependent code. Now you should be able to load multiple elements per cycle from a vector, which is a different topic. OK, so there are a number of questions that you may ask. Uh, OK, this is nice, but what if my number of data elements is greater than the number of elements in a vector register? So I'm adding uh, arrays of length a million, and my vector register has only 64 elements. Well, now you add a loop, basically. You basically break the loop so that each iteration operates on number of elements in a vector register. For example, if you have 512 data elements and 64 different, uh, 64 element vector registers, you do eight iterations of what I just shown you, uh, that loop over there, where vector length is 64. At the end of the eighth iteration, you change the vector length to 15, because there's only 15 more elements that are remaining. And you do one iteration that way. Basically, you code a loop. That's why vector machines need to have branches also. So you need to change the value of vector length 
Now, when you change the value of vector length, it's disruptive because vector length is used by all of the instructions that were previously in the machine. So you need to ensure that no one gets the wrong vector length. This is, again, a data dependence. It's just another register, right? OK, so this is called vector strip mining. You don't need to know uh, exactly what it is, but basically it's looping. So what if vector data is not stored in a strided fashion? Let's make it more complicated. Uh, what if uh, my memory accesses are not nicely strided? Stride 1 is good, as you've seen, but stride 10 is also good because you, you can predict the address. But there are many cases uh, where we operate on data elements that are not as nicely laid out. So the idea to fix this, as I will show you, is use, you use indirection to combine or pack elements into vector registers. Right. Uh, I'll give you one example uh, of this. This is called scatter-gather operations, basically. You can scatter the data into memory to different locations, or you can gather the data from completely different locations as long as you supply a base address. Now, why would this be interesting? Uh, uh, let's... For example, if you want to vectorize loops that look like this, somehow, indirect addresses. Have you ever programmed this way? You have this indirection array. This basically specifies which locations in the matrix have interesting values, and in the vector have interesting values. Let me give you an example. I need to switch to the... So why would this be interesting, first of all? Uh, let's, say, let's say you have a vector... And for some reason, almost all of it is zeros. And you're not interested in the zeros. You have a 5 here, you have 85 here, and you have, I don't know, 32 here. And everything else happens to be zeros. This is called a sparse vector. The interesting information is not zeros, and they're only in 1, 2, 3. Did I miss something? I guess three locations, yeah. You have a million element vector, and only three locations encode good data. So what you do is, when you write out this data, you write it into an index register, and say, I have an index vector. If I'm going to access this vector, I don't know, in this case it was C, I think, C vector, I'm going to index it with this D register. And D register will tell me the indices starting from address C, which contain the interesting elements. Now, what are those indices? Let's say this is, this is the zeroth element, and this happens to be, I don't know, a thousand first element. So the first interesting element happens at 1,004. Right? The second one happens at 1,285. That's the location that happens to be. And the third interesting happens, I don't know, 1,288, just to, 87, just to make it interesting. Basically, I have three interesting elements, and the indices are here. Now, I can have this D element over here, uh, and whenever I want to access the interesting elements over here, what I do is I go like this. Right? Basically, D tells me the index of the location that contains interesting data. I first access that. And then add to it the base address of C. So basically, I access element C plus 1001 in this case. When, the I, when I is equal to 1, I access C plus 1285. When I is equal to... 2, I access C plus 1,287, and the data elements I load are exactly these. That way I get to skip doing the operation on the entire million element vector, because everything else is not interesting, right? Somehow, let's say I sampled the data from some sensor, and I know that zeros are not interesting in that sensor, but I figured out when I was sampling the data, the interesting parts are this. And when I'm processing the data later on, I go back and I only focus on the interesting parts. That way I can do only three loads, as you can see, right? as opposed to doing a million loads. So this is called a sparse vector, and this is called the index vector. And you use the index vector to get to the interesting elements in a sparse vector. So how do you do that? 
in a vector machine. Vector machines have the to do this kind of gather scatter operations, basically. That's exactly what I've shown over here. You're operating only on the interesting elements over here. I is much smaller, basically. So you do need an indexed load instruction. This is called a gather. First, you do need to load the indices, interesting entities in this D vector that I showed you over here. Somebody needs to do that. And then you do need to do a load indirect from this base of the register C, if you will. So basically, you load into vector register C uh, this indirect uh, address. So exactly what I showed you over here, uh, but in a vector mode. We'll see, we'll see another example of this. Basically, the, your base is the register at, uh, that contains this address. You add to it all of these different indices, and you do a vector load. So this is a vector of three elements, right? where i is three, because you have only three interesting elements uh, indices here. If this was 64 interesting ones, then you would have 64 different indices to 64 different locations over here. Okay, and, the, and, and then you load the B vector and then add to it B plus C, uh, just like we've done before. Do the add and then store the result. So let's take a look at this. Basically, as I showed you, it's uh, this implemented to handle sparse vectors, sparse matrices. They use an index vector, which is added to the base register to generate the address. So index, in this case, another example. And in this case, we're going to do a scatter, if you will. Uh, we have this index vector. The interesting elements we're going to store to an array. The interesting elements we're going to store will be element 0 at index 0, element at index 2, element at index 6, element at index 7. And this is the data we're going to store. We're not going to store it in consecutive locations. We're not going to store it in strided locations. We're going to store in indices at these locations. So what does the store, uh, how do we do the store? Basically, you have a scatter operation. What scatter does, it takes the base address of this vector takes the first element in the index vector, adds to it, compute the address, takes the first data element, and places it there. And then it goes to the next element in the index vector, takes the base address, adds to it the index vector, base plus 2, and stores this data element at base plus 2. Next element, takes the base address, add to it 6, which is whatever is located in this next element in the index vector, Store at that location the same element, uh, the same uh, location in the data vector. So base plus 6 gets 71.2. And go to the next element in the next vector, base plus 7 gets 2.71. And the rest of the memory you don't touch. Basically, we don't store anything to the other parts of memory because these are the only interesting locations in the array that we're going to modify. That's how you can modify arbitrary locations in memory, right? Instead of just strided locations. In this case, the arbitrary locations happen to be at base address plus 0, plus 2, plus 6, plus 7. But you could generalize it to any locations in memory starting from a base address. Now, of course, this is not as beautiful, perhaps, because now your address calculation is not a simple base plus stride, uh, base plus stride times the element, right? But to, now your address calculation is uh, base plus the index, where your index is obtained from another register, vector register. It's basically base plus index register i, right? Okay? So it's a pretty simple uh, concept, hopefully. But this is employed, for example, if, if you uh, program with Intel's AVX advanced vector extensions, you will see that there are gather-scatter operations uh, there. Is this clear? Okay, cool. Okay, so what about conditional operations? Let's make this an even more interesting machine. We've already talked about the mask register, right? So uh, what if some operations should not be executed on a vector based on some dynamically determined condition? An example is this, for example. It's pretty simple. Well, maybe I don't need that loop over here, but it's a for loop. Uh, it loops uh, n times. Uh, basically, if ai is not equal to zero, then you store into bi ai times bi. So it's conditional. Now, you need to Im implement conditional operations. And the idea we've seen before is masking, right? Basically, you have this vector mask register. It's a bit mask determining which data element should not be acted upon, right? Uh, in this case, we load vector uh, A into V0, vector B into V1. Now we need to decide which 
elements we should perform this operation on. Which elements should we multiply and which elements we should store this, uh, store uh, the result of the multiply to. So a vector mask is set based on the condition that V0 is not equal to zero, meaning AI is not equal to zero. So for each element in A up to vector length, this operation basically sets a bit after checking this condition. Does that make sense? You do that for each element. In the end, the result is a vector mask register in a vector machine. Of course, you can have many of these, but let's say this is your vector mask register. Uh, zero through, let's say you have 64 elements. Basically, it's a bit mask. What that operation that I showed you does is it checks whether vector zero is not equal to zero, right? And we set the vector mask based on that. So you have another vector register, vector zero, which is wider. Zeroth element, 63rd element. This is vector zero. You basically, what this operation does is, we mask uh, equals vector zero is not equal to zero. You take each element of vector zero, you check if it is equal to zero, you send it to a functional unit. Now, if it's equal to zero, if it's not equal to zero, you set this bit to one. And then you go to the next element, do it for elements. Now, if, let's say, uh, most of this is zeros, but the last one, last one is a 56. And I, I drew it longer because it's 64 bits wide, right? Last one is not zero, for example. The result of this operation would be we're checking if vector zero uh, element is not equal to zero. In this case, it is equal to zero, right? So you get all zeros, right? Because the condition is not true except for this one. <laughs> Only in this case, this Boolean equation is uh, true. This element is not equal to zero, so you set this to one. Make sense? Now, this may be a, basically, if you're going to use this for the equation that I showed you over here, now you really need to do only one. Let's go back. Yeah, we were checking this. And we need to do the multiply only really on that particular uh, location that's not zero, right? Oh, you cannot see it. And in that particular example, I showed you that only the last element is not zero. So what this multiply, the way it will operate is what we're doing is really multiplying V0 times V1, right? And storing the result somewhere. Somewhere is V1 over here. Vector multiply. So the way with this vector multiply will operate is, well, it will take vector 0 and vector 1. This is vector 1. And Basically, it's a mask multiply because our mask register is set to all zeros except for one location. What it will do semantically is it will not do the multiply for any of these elements, but it will do the multiply for only the element where the mask is set to one. So the result will be you don't do anything over here. You keep this part of vector, vector register one intact. But this part of the vector register will be 56 times whatever this was, whatever this value was, 56 times the previous value of V1 uh, at location 63. Basically, you do only the masked operation. Ma only the element that at a mask bit set to 1 will be operated on. Okay? So it's a very powerful. So how do you implement this? Is another question. Yes, so this multiply is operating only uh, on the elements uh, whose mass bits are set to one. It could be zero elements, right? It might happen that this is none of this, none of the elements uh, are not zero. All the elements are zero. As a result, this multiply will essentially be a no-op. It won't change anything. Right? And then you do the store. Store also operates on the uh, mask operations. So you can think of this as Initially, if you don't change the mask, everything, all of the bits in the mask register are set to one. All of the elements will be operated on. Now, if you change the mask, some of the bits may become zero, and those bits 
specify the elements that are not going to be operated on by the remaining re instructions that come. And then you may change the mask again later. Okay, so this is actually a very general concept. It's, it's also called predicated execution. Basically, you, execution is predicated on the mask bit. If the mask bit is true, you do execution. If the mask, is not, mask bit is not true, if it's zero, you don't do the execution. It's called predicated execution because you have a predicate. Predicate is that bit, right? If the, you, you operate if the, only if that predicate is true. So if you hear this term, which actually exists in many processors today, ARM, for example, called it conditional execution. You conditionally execute some instructions, except you don't do it in a vector manner, you do it in a scalar manner. Even in the scalar domain, you can have this mask bit that says, oh, if this mask is true, execute the operation. Otherwise, don't execute the operation. That way you can eliminate the branches. In this case, we eliminate the branches, right? You could have had a branch over here in the vector machine, which is a horrible thing to do. But now, there is no branch in the machine, right? It's really branching over here. But the branch is gone. Instead, we have a vector mask that says if the data value in this register, mask register, is zero, do the operation. Otherwise, don't do the operation. So this is very fundamental, actually. What we've done is essentially, this is, if you look at this, this is a control flow, right? We've converted that control flow of dependency. This operation is dependent on the outcome of this branch. Here, there is no branch. We've converted that branch into a data dependency. Now, the operation is out, dependent on the outcome of this data that's produced by this mask operation. And the data is a bit saying whether you should do the operation or not. So it's a very fundamental concept. It's independent of vectors, vector machines. You can convert a control dependency into a data dependency this way and eliminate the branch. Okay. So let's look at one more example of this. It's another fun example. Uh, you can actually go crazy with it. You can do any kind of masking operations. And we will see how GPUs do it. So uh, I'm, t I'm showing you right now here, uh, the way it's done right now this way is uh, you do it with a, with a programming, right? GPUs do it underneath. Underneath, they do this kind of execution. So uh, basically, if you want to uh, execute this code in a, a vector machine, you first compare A and B, vectors A and B, to get the V mask. And then that V mask, based on that V mask, you do a vector mask store of A into C. Now there's an else part of it over here. So the first V mask stores all of the elements, assuming that the element uh, is in the A is greater than the element in the B into C. Now you need to do this else part of the code. What do you do? You complement the vmask. Right? You've already calculated this mask bit depending on this condition. Now these condition, for, for the elements where this condition is true, you do this operation. That's this mask store of A into C. For the elements where the condition is not true, which means that you complement, that's a not of the vector mask register, you do a mask store of B into C. And then you set back the mask register to all ones at the end once you're done with this operation. So it's pretty simple. Well, and this is one example over here. Basically, if A and B look like this in memory, your vector mask would look like this because we're comparing if AI is greater than or equal to BI over here. Now, you can look at this example on your own. So how do you implement these instructions? Now, if you go into the hardware design of it, there are two ways of implementing it. One is this, basically, simple implementation. You have the 64 element register, and you have one bit for each of the elements. Yes? So does not any operations Oh, how do you operate on VMask, basically? Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, so that, that goes into more complicated things. You're thinking uh, deeply. Uh, for the example that I assumed, we're not manipulating VMask in any other way. But uh, actually, this, that becomes an issue. And so how do you mask the masked operations, right? If you want to generate much more complicated predicates, you operate on the vmask register as well. But let's not go into that over here. So that turns out that ought to be an issue in the predicated machines. If you have questions, let me know. 
afterwards, though. OK, uh, so how do you implement this? Basically, one way of implementing this is you execute all of the 64 operations, but then if the mask bit is 0, you discard the value. That's, a, that's an energy inefficient way of implementing it, right? Basically, you, you see this is one way of Basically, we have this uh, array A and B. We're adding element by element, uh, putting the result into the C. And then we have the mask bit vector for each element, as you can see, mask 0, mask 1, dot, dot, dot. And after we produce the results, we check the mask bit, and mask bit is our write enable into the destination register element. Sounds good, right? It could work. It works, actually. So you write disable if the mask bit is 0. If the mask bit is 1, that's good. So if almost all of your mask bits are 1, maybe this is not a bad idea. But if your mask bits, you have 64 entry register, and your, one of your mask bits is only one, only one of your mask bits is one, then you're doing 63 operations useless. Right. So there's another implementation which is called the density time implementation. Basically, you have some logic over here that basically goes and scans the mask bit. And you only fetch from those vector register elements that you need to operate on. So there's some logic, additional logic, that goes through and says, oh, I'm going to operate on element one, element four, element five, element seven, and I'm going to fetch only from those locations in the registers. And only do those operations, be frugal about it. Now, which one is better? Depends on how you do the scan implementation over here, right? Depends on how you can fetch from your vector register. Sometimes if, 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 if you, so if you're always operating on all of the elements in your vector register, you can actually do a FIFO queue, right? You basically stream through your vector registers. Here you need to be able to fetch from different locations in your vector register now. So it's a trade-off again. So there are multiple trade-offs. And also it depends on how many, ma how many, how many bits are set in your mask, mask bit as well. But you cannot maybe uh, think about that as, when you design the hardware. That may be difficult to predict. OK, let's talk about some more issues. So stride and banking. Uh, let's go back to the stride and banking, because it's really important. Uh, I'll, I'll be a mathematician over here. Uh, now that you're not a mathematician, maybe. Maybe you are, but that's OK. Uh, so this is a difficult problem, actually. Uh, as long as stride and banking are relatively prime, do you guys know this term, relatively prime? Yeah. OK, good. <laughs> So basically, they're uh, not divisible with each other, right? 3 and 5, for example, are good. Uh, yeah, to each other. And there are enough banks to cover the bank access latency. We can sustain one element per cycle throughput. I'll let, I'll let you think about this a little bit. So 2 and 16, for example, are not relatively prime, right? Uh, 4 and 16 are not relatively prime. If your stride is 4 and you have 16 banks, some elements, if, you're, if your stride is 16, 16 and 16 are definitely not relatively prime, for example, right? If your stride is 16 and you have 16 banks, all of the accesses will go to the same bank. So when you're designing these machines, you'd like to try to make things relatively prime. Relatively prime is difficult when you have an even number of banks. That's one of the problems. Uh, storage of a matrix, we covered this actually early on. Uh, so now... Uh, how you store your data very much dictates your performance. So row major order, we've discussed this earlier. Consecutive elements in a row are laid out consecutively in memory. In fact, I may have the uh, picture over here, but I don't. Oh, I do have it. But we, I'll have another picture over here. Uh, column major order, consecutive elements in a column are laid out consecutively in memory. So the problem is sometimes you may access and a matrix in row major order, sometimes you may access it in column major order, right? The pro and you need to change the stride when accessing a row versus column. And one stride may be nice, one stride may be one, but the other stride may be 16. So now you have a problem. You access the same matrix at different times with different strides. One stride is nice because you're, it's, it's relatively prime to the number of banks that you have. But the other stride is not relatively prime, so you get bank conflicts. And this is a very fundamental problem. How you lay out your data significantly determines your memory throughput, how many, how, much, how many data elements you get from your memory. But then your access pattern also de determines your memory throughput. 
So remember this picture that I had in a different way. Uh, we, we have this matrix multiplication. We're ma multiplying matrix A with B. Uh, and if we're doing this uh, matrix load of A into vector register 1, basically we want, to we want to load this row into vector register 1, and we want to load this column into vector register 1. Now this is nice because your stride is 1. Consecutive elements of array A, or uh, the, the first row of uh, matrix A, are in consecutive locations. But you also need to load uh, this column into another vector register so that you can do bitwise, uh, uh, you can get the dot product of the two vectors, right? The problem is this B is not stored as nicely. It's stored such that the stride is 10. And 10 is not relatively prime with 16. As a result, when you're loading this column, you get a lot of bank conflicts. So the load of this matrix will be really slow, even though the load of this matrix is really fast. That's why uh, you can get significant performance degradation. So how do you minimize these uh, bank conflicts? You can have more banks. <laughs> a million banks, right? That helps. That's good. Or better data layout to match the access pattern. Now, this is the difficulty of programming. That's why GPUs, if you know the access pattern of your program, lay out your data nicely such that consecutive elements in terms of your stride are in different banks. You need to know the details of the machine. If you go back to that quote, now you need to know how many banks you have in the machine. And this may not always be possible. That's the problem, right? So I show you over here. OK, maybe you lay it out in some other order. So this, this matrix, you lay it out in row major, but you lay this out in column major order. Consecutive elements in a column are in consecutive locations. If you do that, you get rid of the 10 stride. Now your strides over here become one. Right? Remember, this is uh, laid out in low, row major order. Consecutive elements in the rows are in consecutive locations. Uh, but here, if, here, this is also row major, but you're accessing in column major order. So your access pattern is completely opposite of the layout. So you can change the layout such that it's the same as your access pattern. That's good. You fix this problem. But what if later you access this matrix in row major order? Now you have the same stride problem in a different time. So it's very difficult to match your access pattern uh, to the data layout and vice versa. Because you usually access the data structures in many different ways in a program. And... Another possible thing is you do a better mapping of address to bank. You, take, you don't take the last address bits, as I showed you earlier, four bits, remember, at the bottom, but you randomize them, such that you minimize the possibility of bank conflicts. Actually, a lot of processors, memory controllers, do this today to minimize the possibility of bank conflicts, but we're not going to go into that. And this doesn't always work also, but this makes life a little bit harder also, because now the programmer cannot reason about which address goes to which bank. Right. They can reason, but reasoning becomes harder because you cannot uh, purely randomize them because you, the randomization function needs to be predictable, right? Because you're taking an address and mapping it to a bank. Okay. So let me finish uh, this part. We, we, we didn't get a chance to go into GPUs, but we'll do that tomorrow. But basically, if you look at array versus vector processors, this is a purest distinction. Modern SIMD processors are a combination of both. They exploit data parallelism in both time and space. And GPUs are a prime example of this. Remember, array and vector. So let's look at the vector execution. This is a vector processor, right? One element every cycle. But this is really what it truly looks like today. The combination of a vector processor and array processor. You do four elements per cycle, but you also do it in time. So which means that the first four elements in the first cycle, the next four elements in the next cycle, the next four elements in the next cycle, until you finish all the elements in your vector by using four functional units in parallel. So this is really a combination of vector and array processor. And this is how things look like. Basically, you have this register file. You partition your vector registers. So vector element 0, element 4, element 8, dot, 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 go here. 1, 5, 9, go here. 2, 6, 10, go here. Dot, dot, dot. So this is called a lane. Basically, elements zeros get added here. Elements ones get added here. Element two get added here. So it's very, basically, to enable this, you partition your register file so that you don't need a huge register file. Only part of your register file needs to be here. Another part needs to be here. Another part needs to be here. Just like we banked memory, right? 
Elements 0 are in this bank, elements, ones, elements 1 are in this bank, elements 2 are in this bank, dot, dot, dot. Right? So it's a beautiful structure. This is very simple. You don't need a huge register file. Collectively, you have a huge register file, but you can partition it into many small pieces. Okay, so let's, let's have some fun over here. Basically, uh, you, let's, say, let's say we have an example machine that has 32 elements per vector register and eight lanes. Eight lanes mean eight of these, eight functional units at a time. Uh, we can complete 24 operations of, for, per cycle while issuing one vector unit instruction per cycle. Let's take a look at the load units, multiply units, add units. Each of them have eight functional units, eight lanes. You start with a load. You have eight functional units, and you have 32 elements per vector register. So in four cycles, you finish the load. And you have 32 operations here, eight operations per cycle. In the next cycle, you can start the multiply. Eight multiplies per cycle, four cycles because you have 32 elements. In the next cycle, you can start the add, eight adds per cycle, and four cycles. That's the latency of the complete add. So basically, at any given point in time, you have 32 operations, uh, eight times three, 24 operations. And here, once the load unit becomes free, you can start the next load. Once the multiply unit becomes free, you can start the next multiply. Once the add unit becomes free, you can start the next add, dot, dot, dot. So that's how you keep a GPU or a SIMD unit busy. Okay. Uh, let me finish this one also. How much time do we have? Okay, let's not finish this one. This is a good place to start uh, the GPU lecture tomorrow. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow.